This is Twit. Okay, so it's called the CAN bus, C-A-N, which is a convenient acronym since when you once you gain access, you can do anything you want. Um, the CAN bus appeared and became standardized during the nine during the nineties. Uh, and it's now present in, it's become like the way things interconnect in our, in our vehicles. It's present in every automobile built since because every component in today's cars, uh, are hooked up to this single bus. Uh, it's used to control everything in the vehicle from steering to unlocking doors to the volume of the radio, the fuel air ratio mixture. I mean, the yeah. transmission, ECU, everything. ECU, power steering, power brake. Basically, everything in the car is connected right. to the controller area network. Yes. Uh, it's a straightforward protocol, which is part of the reason why it succeeded. Not encrypted. Uh, Correct. Each message has an arbitration ID and a payload. No authentication, no authorization, no signing, no encryption. It's like Rev.1. What could possibly <laughs> go wrong with that? Exactly. Well, like, see, 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 here's the thing. Here's the thing, uh, though. That was fine. The, the CAN bus was fine because cars were isolated. But yes. then they were connected and auto manufacturers yes. never thought, hey, you know what? Maybe that connected device shouldn't be connected to the completely unauthenticated, unencrypted network inside the car well, that runs and, everything. And to their credit, they, they I mean, after the first generation of problems, they said, ooh, maybe we shouldn't have one bus. Maybe right. we should have a couple buses. And in fact, there are some there there's some use cases for a high speed bus where you need much closer to real time stuff like oh I don't know braking uh steering <laughs> uh Airbags. No, collision avoidance radar <laughs> that would be handy to have a low latency on and then things like you know door locks and and you know seat move, movement back and forth I mean everything is on the bus so there's slow speed and high speed what you would wish was that they were isolated. Right. But there's a gateway that that interlinks the buses. So we don't have complete isolation because that was just a bridge too far. Um, so, yes, as you know, it's wide open. Once you're on the bus, you can send arbitrary messages a, as an equal peer. It's just a complete peer uh, communication uh, backbone, send arbitrary messages, which will be received by all parties connected to the same bus. There's no sender or recipient information. Uh, and each component decides for itself if a message applies to it. So as exactly as you said, and as we often say on this podcast, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so, um, a, a, a couple researchers, working for uh, a group CompuTest uh, in the Netherlands, decided to sit down and see what they could do. Uh, and in their research, they wrote, we started this research with nine different models from nine different brands. These were all leased cars belonging to employees of CompuTest. Since we are not the actual owner of the car, we asked permission, which I thought was very nice, for conducting this research beforehand from both our lease company and the employee driving the car. Hopefully not while they were driving the car. Uh, we conducted a preliminary research in which we mapped the possible attack vectors of each car, determining the attack vectors was done by looking at the architecture reading public documentation, and by a short technical review. They said things we were specifically searching for were cars with only a single or few layers between the cellular connection and the high-speed CAN bus, cars which allowed us to easily swap SIM cards, um, and cars that offered a lot of services over cellular or Wi-Fi. You know, meaning, you know, if it was 
a recent car but didn't have much in the way of a radio link feature set one would expect it to have you know less opportunities a, a, basically a smaller attack surface um and then it, and then they said from here we chose the car which we thought would give us the highest chance of success um and they go on to describe their attack I wanted to show you, though, Padre, in the show notes. And the next page from where I am is the result of an NMAP port scan. I love this. <laughs> this Actually, by the way, this is how the original duo did it. Uh, so Charlie uh, Miller and Chris Valasek, they started doing port scans, and that's how they figured out, oh, my gosh, everything's open. Yeah. Yeah. They found an open port, 20, port 23, Telnet is open, <laughs> is like responding to connections. Um, <sighs> and I mean, and there's a whole bunch of, they're, they're not down in the, the, 23 is the only one down in the service port range. The other ones are like, you know, 10123, that's open. Uh, 15001, that's, that's accepting connections. 21002, 21200. They look like they were kind of chosen by uh, like programmers who said, oh, let's just choose, you know, 22111, 22222. Aside from 23, you know, none of these are standard ports, so no one will be able to figure out what they do. Yeah, they're, oh, no one will even, even think of looking up there. And then 49152. My favorite. Yes, <laughs> that that had universal plug and play. What are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you want UP and P in your car. Oh. Oh, oh and by the way, uh, the default credentials for that are admin and Linksys. So, you know, just, yeah. just FYI. Uh, oh, that's horrible. So, I know. So they said, after further research, we found a service on the Golf. They ended up choosing a Golf from among their nine uh, starter cars with an exploitable vulnerability. Initially, we could use this vulnerability to read arbitrary files from disk, but quickly could expand our possibilities, they write, into full remote code execution. Yeah. Yes, run code on the car's processor. They said this attack only worked via the Wi-Fi hotspot, so the impact was limited. They said you have to be near the car and it must connect with the Wi-Fi network of the attacker. But they said, but we did have initial success. And then they show obtaining a shell, uh, uh, dot slash exploit, and the, the IP was 192.168.88.253. Uh, and it, they, they, they show it says, system seems vulnerable. Enjoy your shell. <laughs> And then they do a U name hyphen A, and sure enough, QNX is the uh, little uh, version of OS running on this machine. Now, so, uh, Steve, a, a little background for our audience. The yeah. reason why this only works through the hotspot uh, is not because of engi any engineering that they did. Back to the, the Miller and Velasek hack, after they, they showed the world what was possible, the auto manufacturers worked with the carriers to make it so that you couldn't just randomly ping those devices. Uh, but we have, uh, like Emily the Strange in the chat room is saying, is that's why she has all that stuff turned off on her new car. It doesn't matter. The device is still active. It's still there because they yeah. need a way to be able to turn on the service if you happen to start paying for it. So that device is still in your car and it is still accessible, but this hack was done remotely, so I mean, uh, locally. So they'd have to actually be within yep. Wi-Fi range. If it wasn't yep. for those carriers, however, and if you happen to change to a carrier that doesn't block that port scanning, you are now vulnerable over the internet again. Yeah. Yeah. So they they can they they did not disclose they were responsible. They did not disclose publicly what they found, but uh, Volkswagen is scrambling. Uh, they said in their conclusions, internet connected cars are rapidly becoming the norm. Mm -hmm. As with many other developments, it's a good idea to sometimes take a step back and evaluate the risks of the path we've taken and whether course adjustments are needed. That's why we decided to pay attention to the risks related to interconnected internet connected cars. We set out to find a remote exploitable, remotely exploitable vulnerability 
which required no user interaction in a modern day vehicle and from there influence either driving behavior or a safety feature. They said, with our research, we have shown that at least the first is possible. We can remotely compromise, and then they use some acronyms, the MIBIVI, which is the sort of the, the vehicular entertainment and extra right. features side. And from there, send arbitrary CAN messages on the IVI CAN bus, which again is not the, the sensitive one, it's the the more entertainment side, but it's also the one that shows your dashboard instrumentation. And, you know, and as we know uh, from, from the, the previous hacks, you can do things like, you know, put up, hi there, how you doing, fella messages, you know, where it's supposed to be showing you your re remaining miles of gas and so forth. And, yeah. and, and, and they say, as a result, we can control the central screen, speakers, and microphone. They said, this is a level of access that no attacker should be able to achieve. However, it does not directly affect driving behavior or pose any safety risk due to the CAN gateway, which we mentioned is isolating multiple buses within the car. The gateway is specifically designed to firewall CAN messages and the, bu and the bus the IVI is connected to is separated from all other components. Further research on the security of the gateway was consciously not pursued. And actually they had, they did some moralizing later on about, you know, proper conduct and what you need to do and advice for people who are doing this kind of research right, so you don't right. end up being jailed and so forth. But anyway, uh, we're driving, it is, you know, we are driving computers and they are becoming connected computers and you know, uh, in a way, they're a little IOT like in as much as the manufacturers just want to sell cars. They don't want to sell computers. People want the features of, of mobile computers. So that's what they're selling. But they're, you know, they're, they're certainly paying attention to security. And the good news is this kind of coverage keeps the automotive manufacturers focused on that need, which is all for the best. You know, Steve, ultimately, this is this is just a pivot attack. This is the ability to get into yep. a device, own the device, yep. because now you can run yep. code on its processor, and yeah, then you can connect to the other side, and the other side is the CAN bus. Oh, uh, I, we had talked about this at the last DEF CON, and, and one of the ideas that I kept pushing was I said, look, the reason why white manufacturers want this is because they want access to the error codes on the CAN bus because that's that's where they can give yep. you your value add. And so that's why they're so reluctant to separate that entertainment system from the CAN bus because if they do that, then they don't have that, that value add. I said it, it actually would be trivial for them to create an interface that only allows one direction communication and that really should only be one direction. There's no reason why the entertainment system should be issuing CAN bus commands to the rest of the vehicle. So you can set it up so that the CAN bus can issue error codes to the uh, to the entertainment system, but nothing can come back. That's just a simple firewall. Right. Um, and, and the right. fact that they haven't done something like, like that yet, it really kind of tells me that maybe they're not putting as much into security as they say they are. Yeah. Well, and again, features versus security. Yep. They would, yep. they've, you know, they want to have the features. I had a, a car. I don't remember now if it's the one I'm still driving. It might be that was firing off some um, spurious service engine soon warnings. You know, like the little the little idiot light on the on the console would just come on. And I remember taking it in once, and there was nothing wrong. And so they reset it. And then, uh, like a few weeks later, it turned on again. I thought, okay, this is dumb. So I just got myself you know, a, a, a dongle and reset it myself. So that was kind of cool that I was able to do that. But uh, it's so it's, it's the it's the power of that bus that yep. gives you features. Yep. But you sure do wonder uh, where they are from a security standpoint. Yeah. It, it also and we, we also know very much, you know, uh, the, the famous example was trying to have encrypted keys on the DVD. 
If you're going to play the DVD <laughs> in the living room, it's got to decrypt it. So the keys are in the DVD player. Similarly, you, there's nothing you can do like having a secret password or secret keys in a car that only the service technician's equipment has. Because if the keys are in your car, hackers can get them. So, you know, that's futile. Isn't it kind of strange, Steve, that since the early days of what we're doing right now, the topics haven't really changed. The technology no. has gotten more interesting, but it's still this whole idea of, doesn't matter what kind of security precautions you put into place. If you leave the key in a public area, someone's going to own it. It's there, there's no way around that. 